God. Yes. Finally, uh, impenitent. Don, this agrees with John chapter 6, verse 65. Why don't you yes. read that to us? Jesus went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. That enabling us is the foreknown, effective persuasions, yes. as well as rearranging the carousel at the proper time mm -hmm. to drop it in at the right moment. That is God's enabling us, yes. but we still have our free will. Until God does that, we just stay where we are. We don't take any steps at all. We don't move. Let's continue on with Ephesians <clears throat> chapter 2. Uh, continuing on, we're defining grace. What is grace? Mm -hmm. What does it mean? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Yes. So God is the one who acts. It isn't our works that we do on our own. It's what God does and how we respond to God. So no one can say, I started seeking God before mm -hmm. he started seeking me. Yeah, no one can say, God responded to me because I set out to find him. If someone sets out seeking God, it's because God has arranged persuasions that motivate him to do so. And so in this uh, teaching that you're giving, 1 John 4, 19 still works. We love because he first yes, loved, loved us. us. Mm -hmm. His love to us is arranging the foreknown effectual persuasions, mm -hmm. bringing it together in the sovereign timing. That's the grace that we're talking yes. about. All of this manifests the sovereignty of God in ways that, again, take me to my knees and say, mm -hmm. what a God. Yes. What an infinitely wise, <laughs> knowing, loving God. I want to worship this God. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to get to know this God. I want to be intimate with Him. Yes. And His sovereignty, your definition of sovereignty blows me away. Thank you, Bob. It's really been such an encouragement to me and has helped me to see Things in Scripture that appear to be contradictory are actually paradoxes waiting for us to seek to understand. In fact, it seems to me the way these paradoxes are presented in the Word of God without a detailed explanation is an indication that people centuries ago understood this. They just sensed that these things are uh, compatible with each other and they didn't feel a need to belabor an explanation. But over a period of time, we've sort of gotten to a state of mind where we need to dig in and seek to resolve the paradox point by point. But let me try to express a summary of how sovereign God is. God is working to bring about the maximum amount of good for the greatest number of people through the most efficient means for His greater glory. Okay, let's stop there. Let's pick that first part apart. God is working to bring about the maximum amount of good. Mm -hmm. So God is in this for our good. Yes, for His good and ours. Ex uh, Jeremiah 32, 40, God has made an everlasting covenant to never stop doing good to us. Yes. So that hurricane might be good for us. That job loss might be good for us. That hurricane can be a negative shepherd. That job loss can be a negative shepherd. There are people that will be in heaven who wouldn't be there apart from something like a hurricane or like a dictator. It's a, there are all sorts of things that persuade people to take shelter in the embrace of God. For those in my life who have come across cancer, who have come across great disasters, Jeremiah 32, 40 is what I take them to. Yes. If the scriptures are true, it means that this is for your good mm -hmm. and you've got to trust God. Yes. And this helps us understand it. God is working to bring about the maximum amount of good. It may be seen as a catastrophe or disaster, but it's for our good. For the greatest number of people, He's not just doing it for you. Mm -hmm. He's not just doing it for me. He's doing it for every person on the globe. Yes. Through the most efficient means, God's not wasting His, uh, his energy, His time, His power, bringing circumstances into our lives that aren't going to do anything for us. He's bringing about circumstances that'll keep pushing us toward the goal of getting us to cry out to our Creator for mercy, to be at His mercy. All of that for His greater glory. Yes. As we, I like to think, Don, a good part of the first speck of eternity, because <laughs> how long can you say billions of years are to eternity? Mm -hmm. The first part of the speck of eternity are going to be watching the videos 
of the glory of God put on display of how he worked in every individual's life. Mm -hmm. And we'll see that that video impacted this video, which impacted that video, which impacted that video, and God arranged it all. And we are going to be in heaven and cry out glory yes. to God. Now, how sovereign is God? Why don't you read the second part of your definition? God is so sovereign that he can fill an entire planet with billions of people possessing genuine free will, with most of them exercising free will in rebellion against him, and still he overrules all the consequences by bringing human history to its God-appointed end, the revelation of his glory. What a God. Yes. What a God who can create humanity with free will and still overrule. Yes. By injecting us with, with certain desires, things that are in our nature that we're going to respond to, that God can, can in His love work so that we're responding in certain ways, so that we do what He has designed beforehand should be done. He has yes. good works appointed before the beginning of time for each mm -hmm. of us. God overruling all the consequences and bringing human history to its God-appointed end. Yes. That is a God worth worshiping. That is real sovereignty. And that is a God worth getting to know. The kind of sovereignty that only an infinite being could manage. Now let's, let's try to step back a second, Don, and get us back to the big picture. God, who is love, wants to love and be loved. Yes. In so doing, he wants to create beings that he can freely love and freely receive love. But the best love that there's going to be is free will. Yes. And in order for there to be free will, there must be a demonstration that someone can choose not to. Hence, Lucifer, the angels were created. Otherwise, free will remains a theoretical thing. It's sort of just on paper. And there might be people doubting, is it? How do we know it's really there? Mm -hmm. No one's ever, ever exercised the option of rejecting or choosing not to love God. So God creates first the angelic beings. Yes. Lucifer falls. Possibly a third follow him. Mm -hmm. Because he had such insight, there was no opportunity for repentance for him. No redemptive it, plan no for redemptive Satan plan. fallen angels. Then God in his sovereignty, casting him down to the earth, creates a new race, a new breed, yes. starting with Adam and Eve. Yes. They too are not bound by a sinful nature. Mm -hmm. They still have free will or free choice. J Satan sees it, gets in there, and begins to manipulate them to yeah. exercise their free will to rebel against yes. God. Another reason why they're in a somewhat different category of guilt from Satan is because no one was tempting Satan to sin. He tempted himself. But Adam and Eve fell when tempted by a being that they perceived as more powerful, more responsible, and wiser than themselves. So Eve, with her free will, is exercising it, choosing to follow the wisdom of the serpent. She, in her free will, chose, chooses the, the to eat the apple. The perceived wisdom of the, the serpent. The perceived wisdom right. that would be there. Adam fell. The whole race falls. With him. But because their insight is so limited, God puts in a redemptive plan mm -hmm. to redeem them. Yes. And then sovereignly, as we just looked over in that definition, overrules all the consequences of free will yes. to bring about people who will worship him, enjoy him, will, will bask in his glory. The more they enjoy his glory, the happier they are. Mm -hmm. And so as John Piper says so well, God totally glorified, man totally satisfied mm -hmm. forever. Yes. God is loving. They're receiving the love. They're loving. God is receiving the love, the creation, the way he designed it to be. Now, you were saying that I would express things better. I think sometimes you express things much better, Bob. Thank you for that. <laughs> I summary. don't think so. <laughs> so, <clears throat> let's get back to the DA people. Yes. The finally impenitent. The sad part of the story. What happens to those who, of their own free choice, their own free will, choose not to respond to God's persuasions? And persist in their lack of response to the moment of death. Well, Scripture says, it is for man once to die, and after death, the judgment. And so they do fall under the judgment of God, and it's sealed. There is no change of destiny for them 
after death, no second chance after they die. Otherwise, that verse I just quoted, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, would not be in the Bible. There are those who think that ultimately everybody will be saved, but they have no basis in Scripture to say that. Jesus constantly warned about hell, constantly warned that it's a place from which once a person is incarcerated there, there's no escape. The story of the rich man who enjoyed good things in his life but did not thank God for them. He ends up in hell. So that is where they go. Matthew 13, mm -hmm. verses 40 to 42. Jesus in a parable said, As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, Don, from that passage, there will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Yes. Uh, obviously, pain uh, is in hell. It's involved in hell. It's a very painful place. You've used the word stress. Stress is needed. Can you talk about that? Yes. The idea of a variety of stress levels in hell, stress levels to which various people are subjected to, when they're incarcerated there, came to me when I heard a Radio Bible preacher express his view that hell would ring with blasphemy from one end to the other for the rest of eternity. You mean people in hell would be shaking their Shake, fist at yes, God saying... Yes, blaspheming God in spite of the pain. That, and I thought, wait a minute, that does not square with Scripture. And the passage that came to my mind was Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, where Paul wrote, Therefore God exalted him, meaning Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And then Paul names three places where every knee will bow. And we tend to overlook the third one. Mm -hmm. And I think that Radio Bible preacher was overlooking the third place where every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Paul wrote, every knee shall bow in heaven, that's the first place, and on earth, that's the second place, and under the earth. That Surely, would be hell. When Paul used the phrase, and under the earth, he was referring to people who are incarcerated in hell. So, people in hell will not be blaspheming. Mm -mm. Rather, their knee will have bowed to Jesus, and their tongue will confess that he is Lord. So how does that come about? That people who are evil enough to re reject all the persuasions God could have provided for them in this world will be under the control of another kind of persuasion in that place of incarceration in hell. The stress that they feel there is a stress that is beyond the stress that their physical body would have been capable of feeling here in this world. I mean. Stress gets beyond a certain level. What happens? We die. There's mm -hmm. only so much that the human body can take and we keep on breathing. But in hell, they are sustained at a, at a stress level that does bring them to their threshold of submission. So they don't blaspheme. They are in submission. Mm -hmm. Now, the sinful nature is still there. And if God were to relax the appropriate level of stress for a given individual, Below that critical level, once again, the physical, the fallen nature would begin to manifest itself in hostility to God. But they are sustained at that threshold of submission that is beyond the reach of what could be given here in this life, in this world, but there it is effective. Now, God wants to bring as many people as possible to the threshold of submission in this life. That is what he prefers, but if that fails, if people absolutely reject the offer of mercy, the appeal of both categories of revelation that we've been talking about, God's fallback plan is, all right, since these other persuasions are not working for you, I have one that will. Mm. This is so key, I want to review it. Hell is a place where every knee bows and every tongue confesses. There will not be people rebelling, rebelling in hell. They won't even be remembering the sins they committed in this life with desire to repeat them. There'll be total repentance. Total, re so they're repenting. 
Yes. But the amount of stress needed to get them to repent, the yes. amount of, uh, you, you told me a long time, the twisting of the arm, the amount of stress that's going to be, be required to get them to repent would mm. be greater than what they could receive here on this earth. They would die. They would die if it was that strong here. And so when they do die, God exerts that amount of stress on them mm. so that they repent and call Him Lord, but they are separated from God. Yes. Because the oper once a man dies, judgment comes, and that's permanent. Mm -hmm. So they're in hell, stressed, in a stressful state, having a repentive heart, and their knee is bowing, their tongue is confessing that Christ is the Lord, but they are separated from God. And God is the victor. And let's see if there's another scripture that shows people in hell being not exactly uh, blaspheming Rebellious. God. In Luke chapter 16, verses 23 to 31, Jesus gave us a story of a rich man and Lazarus. And here's what he said about the rich man who, after he died, found himself in hell. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called out in rage, Father Abraham, I demand you send that beggar Lazarus down here to dip his finger in water and coop my tongue. <laughs> I'm in, enraged at this and I want, I want a different room in, in the hotel. Let me guess, another misquote. Another misquote. <laughs> Everyone should notice that this rich man in the midst of his torment is not demanding, he's very polite. He may not have been polite to hardly anyone ever in his, in his life in this world, but he is at his threshold of submission and he's respectful. So he called to Abraham, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Notice he's asking for the very merest favor, not uh, a great indulgent favor because I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed. And that word fixed is a warning, no second chance. Yep. It's fixed, it's permanent. So that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. The rich man answered, then I beg you, Father, notice the politeness. I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. I don't know how much compassion this man felt for his five brothers while he was in this life, but he sure does feel compassion. Mm -hmm. Here's a man who's showing respect, he's honoring Abraham, and he's feeling brotherly compassion for his brothers. He's even respecting Lazarus. So... Sounds like he's repented, sounds he's, like he's he, got the... He's at his threshold of submission. Mm -hmm. it, it validates the concept. Abraham replied, and here's where foreknowledge comes in again, notice. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And Abraham's response was, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. The capacity of the five brothers to reject even the witness of someone resurrected from the dead was foreknown. So a persuasion that was foreknown to be ineffective was not offered. That brings in the uh, concept God doing the greatest amount of good to bring people he knows in their foreknowledge what they'll respond to, what they won't respond to. The greatest number of people, the greatest good for the greatest people, but that does not include the ones who will reject it. Even though they sometimes benefit from a lot of mercies at the end ultimately. So he uses them it. ultimately for his glory. Yes.